I am Keith McCullough, and welcome back to another edition of Real Conversations. We're live here with Raul Paul, who's the co-founder and CEO of Real Vision. You saw me there, maybe, 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 maybe not. We'd encourage you maybe to listen to that conversation. Absolutely, again. yeah. <laughs> now you get to come to our place. So thank you for for doing that. Oh, excited to be here. It was an incredible amount of feedback. We were both. Uh, Surprised and humbled, I think. I know. I think people love the interaction. I guess also because we've got slightly similar views coming from different angles, yeah. different frameworks. I think people like that. Yeah. And uh, I think people have seen us on Twitter, seen us talking about stuff that's similar. So. Yeah, we're the disruptors. Yeah. That the, the exactly old right. wall media doesn't call it disruptors. So that's good. Yeah, that's exactly good. right. But your views, I mean, your views this week uh, kind of go midweek throughout the week. Your views, in particular, on Treasuries started to come to fruition a little faster. And um, we want to get an update on that. I, I think you get a lot of feedback on that view because you were early. Yeah, so I think like you, about the same time, I had been very bullish fixed income. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure whether the curve was going to steepen or flatten first because it's so low right now, I'm not really sure. So I was just long all parts of the curve. Mm -hmm. And the big thing for me is I've, I've always thought if we are going towards recession, which I think we are, that's the, the work that I do based on business cycles, suggests we're in that down phase. If that is the case, then having gone through this several times before, the winning trade tends to be euro dollar futures mm -hmm. or two year note futures, the mm -hmm. front end of the curve. I mean, I've seen more money made in those two instruments than anything else in my entire investing career. Which people, it, it's, it's counterintuitive because when you say you're going to buy two year treasuries, that's so boring. I know. But what's, what's interesting is, is there's a hero trade, which is shorting stocks. That's the ego trade, the one that everybody wants to do. <laughs> yeah. And it's the hardest trade. You know, you know what it's like, I know what it's like. It's very hard. But when you, but treasuries, particularly because you get leverage in the futures contracts, these things, when they move, they really trend. Mm -hmm. And with the implicit leverage, you can make a tremendous amount of money. Mm -hmm. So can you walk through, I, I've seen, you know, I've, I've heard your comments, but I think it would, people would find it interesting to just go through the chron you know, chronological order of what happens when the Fed goes pause and then... It actually happens. The cycle happens. That's right. So, and I've, I've been looking at this because this is something I've done, you know, when I was running a global macro hedge fund yep. and also when I was at Goldman as well. Um, it's a very typical thing. So what happens at the, at the end of the cycle, the Fed go on pause. You can see it in the data beforehand. You picked it up. I picked it up in the data. I said, look, OK, it looks like it's turned. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always 100 percent you're going to get it right, but it looked like it had turned. Um, and at that moment, you suddenly start to see the curve shifting shape at the short end, it starts to invert at the short end, and those things start happening. So the Fed go on pause. Now, the Fed used this terminology pause, mm -hmm. but I went back and looked at every single rate cycle that the Fed, since the existence of the Fed, essentially, and there's no such thing as a pause. What happens is, yes, they stop, but then they cut. Mm -hmm. So what you've got is, a, there's no certainties in our world, but what you've got is a probability. Mm -hmm. So there is an increasing probability that the Fed are going to have to cut rates it's very, very, very rare um, for them to suddenly raise rates. In fact, I've never seen a, a version of it before. They usually cut. So the mid-90s, any time they cut for a bit, then raise, then eventually the cycle, mm -hmm. end of the cycle came. There are a few demographic differences in the 1990s, though, you know, that really had that. That was a big head fake for a lot of people. Yeah. But in the modern macro world, I mean, you know, if you just go from post-financial crisis to now, Fed going dovish usually has economic, or always has had economic fall through to the downside. Yeah, always. And because... The Federal is late to pick up the signals. Right. And the economy is slow because people, I mean, it makes me laugh that people were looking last week, everyone got bullish about two weeks ago, on the employment numbers. Mm -hmm. Employment numbers are always lagged, by definition. Mm -hmm. You know, so the interest rates move things, they certainly do, and the rate of increase we saw in LIBOR, Fed funds, and if you take into account the balance sheet as well, it was a huge rate of change. When I look at the year-on-year -year rate of change or the two-year and two-year rate of change of LIBOR, it was the largest in history. So we've had a hell of a tightening. Incredible. But people don't think of it in these terms because they say, well, rates have barely gone up. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what happened to mortgage payments, you know, even if I look at you know, um, any debt payments, most payments have gone up 60 70%. I mean, some of these are really enormous moves mm -hmm. in interest payments that people have got. Mm -hmm. And that has a knock through in the economy, but it takes time. And how, how much, you know, like on the, on the household side, I think most people understand that, particularly if they're listening to this and their individuals, which you and I both have a lot of those. And we have quite wealthy individuals that subscribe yeah. to our channels, which yeah. is interesting because, you know, lo and behold, they made a lot of money somehow. They're probably watching other channels saying, ah, pretty sure that I'm the lemming if I'm watching this. <laughs> um, but the people understand the household leverage. 
The corporate leverage. Yep. Um, I, I was going back uh, with institutional clients all week, going back to the 2000 to 2001 economic slowdown off a mega growth peak. Yep. Um, and just looking at the impact it had on credit, yep. on corporate credit as opposed to the household. How much of that impact, if you're right, if we're going into, uh, I call it the probability is very high that we're going to continue to slow, whether or not we have a recession, yeah. we're going to see. But how much of the, of the reflexivity in that recession would be coming through the mechanism of credit spreads breaking out and corporates having I, a That's time? a really good point. I think, you know, we all, you know, what we have to do in our radar screen in Global Macro is look for where the really weak linkages are. And there are a number around the yes. world. Agreed. Corporate credit is one of them that scares me because of the size of the market, mm -hmm. the relative liquidity or illiquidity that we're seeing in many markets right now. And then we've got some really interesting situations, the biggest being GE. So GE is a triple B. Mm -hmm. Now 50% of the entire credit market is triple B. If GE gets downgraded to junk, which could well happen, well, then you've got $120 billion that come out of triple B into the junk indices, and they become illiquid. Mm -hmm. If the junk indices become illiquid, then everything becomes illiquid. So I'm fearing that, and you know, there's, there's, um, there's General Motors, there's General Electric, there's Ford, there's a whole bunch of companies, and I'm also fearful of AT&T. Mm -hmm. All the old economy companies, and they're all levered. That's right. I mean, clearly, that, that, that's the point. Yeah, so if these start moving down in terms of getting downgraded, so economic weakness tends to see lower earnings, lower earnings means less ability to pay the uh, interest rate coverage that they need. Obviously, interest rates have risen. Mm -hmm. So suddenly it becomes less sustainable than it was. Mm -hmm. not saying these companies are going to go bust, but they will get downgraded. And if that happens, if these massive old world economy uh, companies get downgraded, then I think the entire market becomes a liquid. Mm. So if the junk bond market becomes a liquid, the credit markets become a liquid. Right. And then that knocks back on, back to the regular guy, you know, the dentist who's bor borrowing money to increase his dental practice will suddenly find he can't do it. So it knocks through from Wall Street to Main Street very quickly. Very quickly. I mean, think of all the different businesses, particularly consumer-facing businesses, franchise businesses that are, you know, individuals, small businesses taking on more and more leverage. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a huge knock-on effect. Uh, we, we actually have a chart, I think, guys, if you could throw it up there, that shows um, the size of corporate credit relative to GDP. Slide yeah. 72, I think it is. Um, so we'll show that to, uh, to viewers right now. And, and really, we're at the point that you always, you're always at. This chart here, if you can see it, uh, this is the size of corporate credit is the dot. Okay, yep. as a percentage of GDP. So the dot's the biggest it's ever been. Yep. That's a simple point. If I were to cherry pick, Raul, you'll, you'd know that if I didn't make it as a percentage of GDP, it would be on orders of magnitude, a massive bubble on, uh, in terms of uh, any other we've never seen before. <laughs> but it, on the X and Y axis, you have high yield spreads and, and the move index. And we just started to move. Every credit event, all those years, 2000, 2001, 1991, they're up and to the right. Yeah. And people generally think that this is gonna be a linear pattern. So what I'm trying to figure out here is well, I mean, every single meeting I have with institutional clients, which you used to do, and then you were the client, yeah. they all want to know about the timing. Yeah. And, and it's like, I don't know what the timing is, but it's, it, it's, but it's going to be at some point between now and when you don't want to be holding the bag. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you raised a point when um, we talked uh, at Real Vision, it's all about the rate of change. And people don't look at rate of change. So when you look at the rate of change, firstly, of LIBOR, you can see that things have stretched. Yes. When you start to look at the rate of change of many things, you know, when you start to look at the structure of the move index and how volatility has changed its structure a little bit, there's so many things that are starting to suggest that things are moving. When you look at the rate of change of commodity currencies, there's something not quite right there. Mm -hmm. you know, the Aussie dollar looks again like it's, it's starting to go. So it's, it's that kind of stuff that's starting to really interest me because that's where you see it first. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the rate of change is almost everything in financial markets. It's, mm -hmm. Everything is at the margin. And it's always the people waiting for, I mean, the conversation people have of you know, the recession date, the point being is all the money is to be made or lost before that's announced. Mm -hmm. It's never when it's announced. Well, I mean, most people still don't understand it. It's almost like it's a marketing message. Hi, I run a levered long credit only hedge fund. And unless we have a, unless we have a recession, we're good. It's, it's, it's nonsense. It's and because people are linear in how they project economic <laughs> growth. It just annoys me. It's like, because if you look at every street forecast, there's never an accounting for the fact that if you show a small child the GDP graph, it goes like this. <laughs> That's cyclical, right? And it's never done this. 
for 100 years, 200 years. Right. But every economist assumes that. So I, you know, I never, I never understand why they do that. But what, now what? at least we have uh, Nobel Prizes have been awarded to people like Danny Kahneman that have said, hey, look, anchoring, recency bias, this yeah. is what you do. So yeah. it's interesting to see that the, even the, the Nobel laureates are starting to educate the, you know, the, the establishment econs on what not to do, but they really just don't change what they do. No, so behavioral economics has been a massive change, mm -hmm. but the economics fraternity doesn't listen. <laughs> so they're still doing the same thing. Yes, they're using some machine learning for bits and pieces, you know, the now casting and all sorts of bits and pieces. That's coming into it, but most just don't look at the world in that way. Mm -hmm. And they certainly don't look in the world as in a business cycle world, which is obvious, but they don't know how to model it, so therefore they don't. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'd readily admit that all I need to know is the direction. I can't tell you precisely how fast this comes unglued. I mean, if you go back to 2000, 2001, for example, I think, guys, slide um, 68, I think it shows GDP coming off its cycle peak. Okay, you didn't have a recession. GDP went from 5% in Q2 of 2000 yep. to four, to three, to two, to one. You know, on the way there, you know, GDP, let's just say that most people would say uh, two, two or 3% GDP is fine. To me, that's a nonsensical comment. You don't have a recession, so it's fine. But then if you look at the next slide, you'll see that earnings went from the peak of the cycle in the S&P 500 of 22.9%, which was at that point a record, to minus 18% raw in four quarters. Yeah. Minus 18 in four quarters and GDP was still positive. Yeah. I, 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 I sense that a lot of people forget that part of the movie. <laughs> yeah, and again, it's because of the correlation between certain things and at that point you had an extremely overvalued stock market so any marginal change in GDP yes. came through massively in earnings because there was everyone kind of knew it was overvalued but the fear that came in so the market cratered fast right mm -hmm. you know by the time the Fed um, the Fed was still hiking rates when the Nasdaq was down 40 percent mm -hmm. because it happened also very quickly and then suddenly they had to come in over Christmas and, and start cutting rates mm -hmm. but um, it's that you know, I think we have a similar situation now where we may see earnings evaporate quite quickly mm -hmm. because there's many things, there's underlying credit stuff that's showing that the economy's slowing. You see it in car sales, you see it in durable goods sales, you see it in all the big ticket yes. stuff. It's like, okay, something's not good here. Mm -hmm. And in valuation today, people would say, oh, Keith, but back then, or Raul, back then, the, you know, the S&P 500 was trading over 30 times earnings, so that the market had to go down from that level. It's just not true. You had to have growth slow. Yeah. Always. And then you had to, and profit slowing in conjunction with that. Yeah, I mean, that's always how it works. But the valuation argument now is well, look, the SP 500 is, if you use the wrong number, it's cheap. <laughs> I mean, that's, uh, but credit is, is, is arguably as overvalued and as big as it's in, been in the history of credit. Yeah, I totally agree. And so we have, we're going into the cycle, and the equity market is expensive, the credit market is expensive. So where do you hide? Up until recently, the oil market was very expensive. Mm -hmm. So you know, where is there to go in this? No, there's not a lot of, if I use your outlook, which is more dour than mine, because yeah. I don't use the word recession yet unless I'm talking about Italy or France, yeah. because I, you are there in Italy, so that's, that's right. pretty, even a knucklehead like me can say, hey, look, my call on Italy is it's a recession now because you're in one. Yeah. But I mean, if I put recessionary numbers in our nowcast, yeah. the S&P 500 would be trading at 20 times earnings. Yeah. Because you'd have to take down the EBIT margin of the S&P by 100 basis points at a minimum, and also, 100 off the top. And also, see how I look at it as I use, for example, the ISM as a guide to the business cycle. So at the bottom of the business cycle, the ISM hits something like 44, yep. something like that. Maybe even lower, depending on what cycle you're in. If you put the year-on-year -year rate of change of the S&P, it basically correlates against mm -hmm. it. So depending how severe the fall in the business cycle, that's the that's what you'll see. The momentum. In the term yeah. Yeah, because the rate of change is imputing into the people answering the ISM survey's opinion. Of but the not growth. only that, but even GDP, they're all the same. So yep. basically the whole lot is very cyclical, which means that if the cycle is starts to roll over, you can start projecting forwards relatively easily. Mm -hmm. Not that you're always right, and we're not in the job of being right all the time <laughs> because we would be gazillionaires, it doesn't work that way. What you're trying to do is get probability on your side. Mm -hmm. And the probability is that we go towards recession. Is it a bad one? Is it a mild one? I have no idea. Like you, you know, I stop at, I, I go one stage further than you to say, listen, I think we're going into recession. Probability looks high. How bad? I, I really don't know mm -hmm. yet. But that does tell me if I'm using that framework, um, because I have a longer term macro framework, that's how I've always thought of yep. the world, I'm kind of an 18 months view guy, 
then I think 10-year bond yields are wrong by a factor of, you know, they can halve from here easily. Mm -hmm. The 10-year yield in the US? Yes, I think it's the wrong price. I think the 10-year yield should more be where bonds are trading, where gilts are trading. Now, that would be exciting. I do. (laughs) And I think on this cycle, they get into the cycle lows. I I call it the chart of truth. It's the chart of 10-year bond yields, and Mm -hmm. it's been going down for 30-odd years now. We hit the top of the channel. Everyone's going, oh, my God, inflation's going to break out. That's when I got maximum bullish bonds, as you did as well at that point. And then bond yields start falling again, and most likely they go to the bottom of the channel, which is zero. And I think that's the case. I mean, German bond yields this morning were at 11 basis points. Yeah. Swiss minus 33. Yeah. How do you, like, how, when you look at that in the morning, does that just make you feel good about your position? <laughs> I mean, it makes me feel good. I mean, the U.S. tenure is at 260, 265. I mean, that makes me feel fantastic. Well, look, it's one of the. I know people say, well, currency hedge is not so cheap. Forget currency hedge world. You know, there's you know there's 300 odd, 350 million Americans there who can buy bonds. Bonds look very attractive to me mm-hmm. compared to the uncertainty of the equity market, the uncertainty of the business cycle. Mm-hmm. Why would you not take that now? When you put in the mindset of the retirees, right, we've got 75 million baby boomers whose average age is 65. They're about to go into retirement. Now, they should not be owning maximum equities, which is what they do own. <laughs> Nor should their pension plans, the mutual funds. It's, it's morally wrong what they're doing. They're risking everything on retirement day. But those guys need to own bonds. Mm-hmm. However unsexy 2.5% feels like to them, 2.5% and not losing your 50% of your wealth in one go, is really valuable. Mm -hmm. And they look at things on a relative basis too. I mean, if you're a pension fund allocator to baby boom retirement accounts, you're going to buy a German Bund here, you're going to buy uh, the US tenure. No, exactly. Or you're going to buy twos. Like you said, I mean, twos at 250? And you think we're going into a recession and the Fed's going to cut? I mean, that's going to be an epic move. Yeah. And that's so, there was a great, great trade. The best trade I ever saw was back in 2000. And there was a guy who worked for one of the large hedge fund firms just down the road from here. And he was actually in the UK office. The Fed cut on, I think it was December the 29th or something, uh, 2000. Mm-hmm. He came into the office. He bought as many euro dollar futures as he was allowed to buy um, for his position sizing. The risk manager was like, okay, this is the absolute management maximum <laughs> you can take. So these are euro dollar interest rate yep. futures. He then went to his house in Mallorca for New Year and didn't come back to the office because when these things start trending, they really trend, right? The oh Fed boy. never cut once, they cut all the way in mm-hmm. the cycle. So, and obviously at the peak of an equity market bubble that we'd had in 2000, it was an obvious thing that the Fed were gonna really have to cut rates. So he went to Mallorca in Spain and didn't come back till July when um, <laughs> his boss called him up um, and said, Listen, you've just given back 75 basis points. You're already up 100 and something basis points. You've done spectacularly well. What do you want to do? And he said, I want to double up. And so he, he doubled up his position and he went back to Spain and came in in, no- <laughs> in November, closed the trade, made $200 million himself wow. as his payment for the trade and retired. Love it. Put the trade on, double it, close it. That was it. That's, that- that's all he did in one year, Euro dollar futures. And I've seen Many people, from the Stan Drucker Millers to the Paul Tudor Joneses, um, all do this, the euro dollar trade or the front end trade when it comes mm-hmm. to, uh, to um, recessions or... I love, I, and I appreciate that you recount that. You've been there, you've had real conversations with all these people. And so many people for the last couple of years have been trying the other side of these trades. The 10 year yield's going to four, Ralph. It's going to five. And what you note is they all have one thing in common. They didn't make $200 million at a time. They're trying to make their first couple million, it seems, it's, or trying to drive advertising revenues on some platform uh, or sell newsletters of some sort. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that so many people had this wrong? And also because, you know, I've been around long enough to have seen them do this in Japan time and time yes. and time again. I mean, every single person has lost money shorting Japanese bonds mm-hmm. because everyone goes, oh, it's the wrong price and they can't be here. And they haven't learned that demographics and debt drive bond yields lower. Mm-hmm. So that simple thing is you cannot get bond yields higher. Well, because that would, people are, are seemingly smarter than that. They say, well, it's overvalued. They start with valuation. 
I was actually, I mean, I was with one of the largest asset, Asian asset allocators in San Francisco yesterday. Right. And I asked that very basic question. I said, just the question, you know, who over the years of all these great asset allocation um, you know, decisions that you've seen is known as the JGB bond king? <laughs> yeah. Who? Who bought JGBs and said this is the best trade in the world and kept them? <laughs> Nobody. Everyone's trying to short them all the way through. The and they're way. still doing it with exactly. 10 years. They're like, inflation's coming back. I, I'm like, I, I just don't understand it. Not no, if you understand geez. demographics, the dynamics of debt, and all the other things. Demographics and debt are deflationary, particularly when the cycle slows. I and mean, so is technology, and we're yeah. right in the middle of a massive technology wave. Yeah. But didn't you hear about China? There's going to be a deal. Okay, so this is where we're going to go. Here's another, I, I, here's another one that comes <laughs> round and round. Oh, boy. When you're at Goldman, I'm sure you had to deal with this, but now I have to deal with it. I mean, <laughs> I just need to move to Cayman like you did. So let me guess. But you I mean, went you went to the West Coast, and everybody said, no, but the Chinese they're about to stimulate. Yes. It's going to be fine. So you're, you're stupid to be, you know, you need to be shorting bonds at this point. And buying stocks, Keith. And buying stocks. You can't fight the Fed, you can't fight Trump's tweets, and you certainly can't fight China. Yeah. So, so what do you say, man? Because <laughs> I've been fighting this one all week long. <laughs> the honest truth is, if you look at what the Chinese are trying to do, they're just trying to paper over the cracks. They are not in the game of stimulating the global economy. So all the stimulus they are trying to do is very targeted at the banks, trying to stop everything falling apart. Mm -hmm. So it's much more Japanese in style than the Japanese have done for the last 20 odd years, which is just to stop shit falling apart. Mm -hmm. It's really, that's, that's the key thing for me. And so I don't think that anything the Chinese are going to do is going to stimulate. Meanwhile, it looks, from, from what I get, and I hate to hit when people say this, but what I hear out of DC is um, usually that's, queue for bullshit, but, I, but re well, all I am hearing from people who know this kind of stuff is there is a sea change there about the American dealings with the Chinese, and there is no desire to settle on March 1st. Um, let's wait and see. I, you know, I don't trade these things. I hate these kind of catalysts. I just follow my business cycle stuff mm -hmm. and do my, use my framework, but, but if I look at the world, I think there is an outside chance, not outside chance, a reasonable chance that the Chinese and the Americans don't agree to anything. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly we end up in a slightly more complex world than we thought. Well, that, I mean, that, I, I almost have to give that one away as a non-possibility in these meetings. It's hard to posit that, but that is, I give it away. I just say, okay, let's just assume that everybody knows that this is gonna be a wonderful deal with many, many adjectives, and it's just gonna be great. Everything's gonna be great. Um, but what happens once that deal is signed and the cycle continues to tick the wrong way? We have a deal with the Europeans, by the way. I don't know if you heard about that. The Mexicans, the Canadians, and all the economies did in all three of those places was slow after mm. the deals. So, I mean, very few people actually say there's going to be no deal at all, Ralph. So the other one you get, which will come not yet, it'll come a little bit later, will be the fiscal stimulus deal. Oh, right. Okay. That's the other one that happens. It'll be the there's a massive fiscal stimulus coming. Mm -hmm. So we've just gone through an enormous fiscal stimulus in the U.S. It lasted two quarters. Right, the Japanese fiscally stimulated enormous percentage of GDP over the last 20 odd years, 25 years or so. It just doesn't move the economy, mm -hmm. again, because of the same reasons. So we're getting this big argument now going on between um, you know, people moving away from monetary policy, saying, well, that skewed all the rich poor and everything else, and now we should go to fiscal stimulus, and this will save the world. And mm -hmm. It's not going to save the world either, because the same secular trends are at play. Yes. People don't understand the secular trend. No, it's an important thing. Well, a lot of people look at China through the lens of an American's eyes. So, I mean, that's That's right. And if we go to, for example, a country like India, and you put a massive fiscal stimulus to, to create, let's say, new 5G infrastructure, that's going to change the economic trajectory of a country over an extended period yep. of time. In the US, building a bunch of bridges and upgrading the railroads ain't going to move anything. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a few quarters. And in, in rate of change space anyway, even if you were to have the second, you know, act of God, which got G elected for life, by the way. Um, we have it on slide 118, guys, if you show it, which they stimulated secondary industries, you know this, in China, which is heavy industry, yeah. uh, empty cities, which aren't all empty, but, you know, heavy construction. So when they did that coming out of 15, that blue line went from 0% growth to 14% growth. Yeah. That was 50% of Chinese GDP growth. Yes. 50. Yeah. And now you're comparing against it. Yeah. And the most difficult compares, which are the black bars, the two-year base effect, which we use to model, are about to hit their steepest points in the next two quarters. So it's, it, to me, it's mathematically impossible. <laughs> yeah, true. It's mathematically impossible yeah. unless you do a lot more 
against the most you've ever done. Because that was the biggest stimulus people forget, or maybe they don't even know. I mean, think of all the macro tourists out there that have an opinion on China that have never modeled the two-year base effect or the sine curves associated with anything that's ever happened in China. Yeah. So to me, it's like, I start with that. I'm like, well, it's mathematically impossible yeah. to accelerate against that. Yeah. And that's why we went bearish on China at this time last year. So why would I change that? Yeah. Um, how, I, I guess I wonder, because I get pushed so far to the, but it could be good side, how bad could it get in China? They're going to make up their GDP number anyway. My, I've thought about this for a long time. I've gone from being apocalyptic on China to now thinking it's Japan all over again. Really? Yeah, and I think, you know, can they, can they devalue their currency? Can it go to eight or nine? Is that going to, that's a bad shock for the world. But do they lose control of the banking system? I know a good friend of both of us, Kyle Bass. Um, you know, Kyle thinks that could happen. I think it can, but I have a feeling that it never happened in Japan. Somehow, countries are able to hold it together longer than we imagined. Yeah. We never imagined Europe would hold together as long as it did, mm -hmm. considering how bad it got in, in like 2010, 2012. Yep. And it's still, you know, Yes, a bunch of Italian banks have gone, but it didn't take the entire Italian banking system down yet. It's not taken the entire German one down yet, or the Spanish one yet. I, mean, I think they're still going. Mm -hmm. But so they, they, it seems that you can paper over the cracks longer than people expect. Mm -hmm. So could it be really bad? Yes. Is that the highest probability outcome? No. Yeah, it's, it's hard. To but, get. That, but don't forget, rate of change means yeah. the Chinese are out of the global demand equation. Mm -hmm. right, so that's gone. Mm -hmm. So there is no big pickup. There is no iron ore going to save Australia's recession <laughs> coming. You know, the Australians are going to be stuck mm -hmm. with their housing bubble and their massive household debt, looking at each other, saying, "Well, who's going to buy mm -hmm. our stuff?" And the answer is nobody. Yeah, our model is quad four, and Australia is red as any other country right now. Yeah, and that's another thing. I mean, if if it really was going to be recovering China, a, I'd see it in at least some lick of data or in a market signal. I see it in neither. Okay, no. so so to me, that's what keeps me honest. Is obviously yeah. the market's going to tell me when I'm wrong. And I just can't find it. I mean, you certainly can't find it in anything Australian. No, the only thing is the currency backed off a bit, but the dollar backed off a bit for a while. Looks like the dollar's going to start strengthening again. We'll see. We've, that's one of the few areas we've got slightly divergent yep. views. You're in a topping process, and I'm still in a, I think there's another peak to come. Well, this, as you know, I can go both ways on this, and I will. <laughs> but be, so, so again, this is a major topic on the road, not only this week, but in Boston last week. Um, to get the dollar right, you have to have your European view right. I mean, if, the Europe, if I'm right on Europe and the recession broadens to France, and then again, we get a broadening of European risks, then the euro is going down faster. That keeps the dollar up for longer. Yeah. So I wonder how many people, I, could, I literally, and I said this to you before we sat down here with the camera, on, it's, it shocks me how many institutional investors do not know that Italy's already in a recession. Yeah. And again, when the ECB acknowledged that this week, the dollar went straight up. Because what people have done is anesthetize themselves to Europe. Mm. They've gone from worrying, they went from overweight, like they'll recover, <laughs> to then giving up and then ignoring it, which is what they did with Japan, if you remember. People just ignore Japan now. Yes. And then the macro guys come That's in a great point. once That's every two or three years and they all buy Japan and right. they, you know, they make a bit of money, then it all sells off again, they give up. And that's all that happens. So they're anesthetized now, they don't care. So they're not even listening to Europe. Mm -hmm. So they've, everybody's hyper-focused on the US. They kind of know Australia that's probably not bad, too small, why do we care? China is right now, I think most people are in the slightly benign camp. It's like, it, could you get stimulus? Yes. Will that help us in the US? Probably. Mm -hmm. So they're keeping it on the marginal, slightly benign to positive. The US everybody looks at, and typically everyone just takes a snapshot of GDP now and the inflation and the unemployment numbers and, and the inflation numbers, which are all lagging, mm -hmm. and say, well, it's fine. Hmm. Um, but if you look at the rest of the world really in proper macro terms, Europe is getting worse, China's getting worse, there is, uh, Australia's getting worse, there's no real region of growth. You know, some of the markets, Brazil recovering, India's not doing a great deal. Who's going to save the world? Mm -hmm. The U.S. cycle is rolling over and I, fast. I, essentially, I guess that's why everyone's begging for more cowbell every morning, every meeting, everything I see on Twitter. You know, um, but the, cowbell is interesting because it works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And this is a thing that everybody forgets, that at every market top, the Fed cut rates, the market has this rally, mm -hmm. like, oh, great, we're back in the game again. <laughs> not realizing that the Fed have cut rates because the economy's not good. Right. Or they, they go on pause first, then they cut. 
And then the market tends to have these spikes every time it happens until it's kind of like it's a, after about three cuts, the market goes, oh, I get it now, it's a recession. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and everything goes to a, you know, a correlation of one yes. and falls to the floor. But, we, but every time people think that the first cuts, oh, well, this is bullish. No, because Fed cuts take about 18 months before they start working into the system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it amuses me, but we're doing exactly this now. This equity rally we've had is a very typical one. Right. <coughs> a little bit larger than 2000 and, um, uh, 2001 and a little bit larger than um, 2007, where both those rallies are about 10 to 14%, I think, which is 15 or so percent we've done this time. Mm -hmm. It's, um, and we'll get to some questions. You have a lot of questions here um, <laughs> uh, in, a, in a minute. But I just want to finish that thought on Europe because it's, it's, it's obviously been bothering me. Like I'm, I'm like, how could you not pay attention to one of the top three places in the world when you're trying to calculate certainly a multinational company's earnings outlook? I mean, how could you have a view on any multinational company's view without because assuming that Europe is in a recession? And, the, and the, the level of interest at the institutional client level is, is literally earmuffs. Because... If you had to admit the dirty truth, you wouldn't be as overweight risk as they are. <laughs> it's true, right? Yes. You, cannot, yes. you cannot square away the fact that Deutsche Bank looks like it's going bust. The Germans are openly talking about merging it with another bankrupt bank. Mm -hmm. You've got the Italian banks that look like they're going bankrupt. You've got the Spanish banks going bankrupt. You cannot see those things and say, I need to be taking aggressive risk. Right. But that's the world we're in. So it's a justification is why they don't want to hear it. It's like, la, 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 I'm not listening. Yes, it is. It really is. Um, guys, one more chart, slide 103, I think it is, the European traffic decline. <laughs> now, this is not going away. And this is, no. you know, so as you know, I think this, yeah, I think we have that. There it is. So this, this is the rate of change, as I always do, yeah. of 35 to 54-year-olds, i.e. the people that have the money or the spending capacity in an economy. So when the Eurozone came to be, of course, the positive, there was a positive slope to that line and it was a positive absolute number. Okay, that's great. We're all going to get along. Then it goes rate of change negative, then it goes absolutely negative, and now we're about to go into the depths of the worst Europe's ever seen. Yeah. They don't have a millennial generation. No. They don't have an immigration generation. They don't have anything but people getting older faster, which is precisely Japan. Yeah. And, and I guess that's why people just stop caring about Japan. But it certainly doesn't mean that at this point of the leverage cycle or the economic cycle that it, does, that it doesn't matter. So if you think about what it means, because I lived in Spain for 10 years, so and I saw this. Yeah. I was there over the crisis and saw what happened afterwards. What happens is the definancialization of the economy. People don't care about equities any longer because they've retired. <laughs> what they care about is how much money do I have in my, mm -hmm. in my pension, which is usually fixed income related, which is why all the bond yields are so low because all the pension funds have piled into that and said, that's it, job done, you guys go retire. Right. I don't want to return on my money, I just want you to return my money. And what happens is they spend less because you don't know how long you're going to live for, so you tend to spend less, mm -hmm. so consumption falls, GDP doesn't really recover, nor does industrial production, and things stay like that. Now, that doesn't mean it has to be apocalyptical. I mean, whenever you go to Japan, you see how actually it's an amazing country <laughs> and it functions very well. It just functions at a lower rate of GDP growth. Mm -hmm. And it's a transfer of wealth out of the pockets of the retirees into the economy over time. That's basically what's happening. Because in Japan, they live so long, their kids have retired by the time they inherit the money, which is kind of a weird situation. So it, never, so it flows through slowly, but it flows out of that generation into the economy. And in Europe, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So nobody cares because because <laughs> you don't have racy growth, you don't have racy stock markets, and bond yields will always be low until this whole uh, generation, the demographic decline goes through. Meanwhile, Spain now is overtaking Japan as the longest living people in the world because you've got great healthcare systems, you've got great climate. Really? Is, great that, is that in the last couple of years? Or? Yeah, it's not taken over yet, but the, the forecasts are that they will live longer than the Japanese. Really? Didn't know that. So that's the Spanish. Wow. And the French, the Greeks, the Italians, are just right there. You know, the, the Mediterraneans are immortal. Mm -hmm. So you have an immortal group with not enough real savings yeah. um, who are going to live forever. So consumption is going to fall. They're just chill. I mean, uh, compared to an American who's watching CNBC, chill. Yeah, yeah, I know. The American Definitely. obsession. obsession <laughs> what is my net wealth going to do today? On Let's a real-time basis. <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, Will I hit my number today? Isn't that amazing? And that's in you know, there, there's a schizophrenia. There was almost a panic on Twitter in my community. Uh, maybe three days ago. Uh, like, this is it. The S&P's got to go back to the all-time highs. You know, 
I was getting chirped by the lowest quotient. I, I knew that something was coming. Implied vol was trading at a 50% discount to what had been realized in the S&P yeah. going back, which is pretty much the lowest number we've seen on Tuesday. And then whammo, three down days and I hear crickets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. a, so we're gonna get some questions on that. Let's get, um, let's get into, um, Let's get into the, uh, the, uh, the heart of it. Th this dollar view, actually, because people are, are, are quite adept at, at, at you know, figuring out the differences or the subtleties and in, in the differences in our view. Can you expand, Raul, on your, on your dollar view and, and how would you integrate that into a recessionary type call? Yeah, so my dollar view is based on the fact that there is more dollars denominated debt than any other type of debt in the world. By far. And, and a lot of it is all offshore. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's 15 trillion dollars of that, of which 8 trillion or 7 trillion is in Japan, in China alone. So there's a whole world that's borrowed dollars. So we have a weak, weak dollar period, which the world had for extended period of time going back into 2016. At 15, it turned around. So you've had a weak, flat dollar, low volatility, everybody borrows dollars. That's just how the world works. With the Fed pumping out more dollars into the system, yep. it was a very easy trade. Problem is, is the Fed are not doing that any longer. Mm -hmm. The dollar started rallying. Um, as people realize the Fed balance sheet was going to start shrinking, suddenly there's not enough dollars in the system. Mm. So what do you do? You have to buy back your dollars, um, and so that pushes the dollar higher over time. Mm -hmm. If the Fed are raising rates as well, it tends to suck dollars out of the system. Mm. And it's not to do with, everyone gets this wrong, everyone thinks it's rate differentials or rates outright that's driving the dollar. Currencies, you know, are really complicated in what drives them. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I'm clear on is that there's not enough dollars for the borrowers out there in the system. Shortages of dollars. Just a shortage. But then when you put in the, the, the business cycle dynamics, is if you're going into a business cycle with a shortage of dollars, dollars get repatriated back to the US anyway. The Trump taxes, the repatriation of capital took money out of the uh, European funding markets as well. So that leaves even less money. So the dollar starts rising, everyone starts closing out. Then you get into the economic situation where the US economy slows. Now, the US has more money than anybody else. That money comes home. So that takes more money out of the market. Mm -hmm. The dollar keeps going up. Mm -hmm. And that happened, you know, that was very prevalent into the 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003 period. The dollar exploded into that latter part. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think, and, and it, it was very strong over the 2007, 8. And that was a counter trend rally because we were in a, in a dollar bear yep. market at that time. But it, but it shot higher. Mm -hmm. um, well, that, that's quite typical of coming out of. Um an economic expansion. You know, in our vernacular, guys on slide six, quad one and quad two are, you know, particularly when the whole world's in quad one. Yeah. You know, the world's reserve currency is the dollar and you're going to buy Argentine pesos, you're going to buy everything you want to buy um, in dollars. Yeah. But once you flip into from the peak of quad one or two, which is growth, to anything quad four in particular, that world's reserve currency, you're bringing it home. I mean, you, you do it very quickly. So that's why, like, I'll come, the, I'll be, I basically, I think people ask me this because I was so bullish on the dollar from April of last year till most recently, yeah. and I'm just discussing the Fed having its impact on the dollar as they try to push you to quad three, yeah. try to reflate assets. And I think you said this, it's like, well, that does, there's really a nice edge in my four quadrants of between quad three and quad four in this outlook. Like, as, as, as everyone just saw, we just threw that up there. You can go, if, the faster you go back into quad four or a recession, the dollar rips Number one expected value by a country mile for the dollar, back testing all the quadrants going back historically, is quad four, yeah. which makes sense. So, so, that, so what you're saying is if the Fed stepping back doesn't help the economy, yes. then the dollar has to go higher. Exactly. Right? And, and I'm, I'm of exactly that view. Mm -hmm. Anything that's less, more benign, the dollar falls. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of this cycle, you're going to end up with a very strong dollar, and a Fed that's going to have to be extremely aggressive. You know, we're talking quantitative easing. We're talking, you know, whether you know, I have a feeling Japan may end up having to force a debt jubilee by the end of either this oh this crisis or the next crisis. However, it works. I think the dollar gets killed at the end of it. But first, I think it goes much higher than people expect. That's my outsized risk for this year. It's not. I don't have a position yet. Mm -hmm. I'm watching. I think if the DXY breaks kind of 97, 97 and a half, then I think it's on. I yeah. it's really going to be something that people aren't prepared for. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, uh, that view holds with mine too. I mean, it's range bound within a, what we call a bullish trend. Yeah. So I think people are just picking up on I'm less bullish on it, but it's still a bullish trend. Yeah. And a bullish trend that breaks out to new highs is yeah. a 
you know, is But is we're both neutral right now. I'm yeah. neutral expecting a higher break. You're neutral not sure. Yeah. And that's fine. And it's the right thing to do. You know, just be slightly agnostic for the time being. That's cool. Um, <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, Ral, can you discuss how CYA and a world of machines rule? CYA, we'd cover your ass. Uh, what are the trends that we need to watch out for and how we can use that machine to our advantage? Repeat the, the machine being? The machine being the quants, you know, the 90% of daily trading being systematic. Is this, I think the question, I, I think this is something I, I have a central tendency to say, that you're seeing these one month moves up and down that are basically career risk management moves by PMs at pod shops because they just have to delta hedge directionally with the, the direction that the market just went. Yeah. So they're more likely to believe the last six weeks of the up move in U.S. equities because they have to, yeah. not because they actually fundamentally believe that they should. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that the, the rise of the machine has, has altered the structure of markets, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's altered the structure of the business cycle. Yeah. So, you know, and you, even though you don't use the word business cycle, your quadrants is essentially the yep. different phases of a cycle. And what I'm, what's going to get interesting is... A lot of people think the markets have, have changed structure. I'm not entirely sure. Once we start to see further economic weakness than here, so which will be get pushing back into your quad four, going towards my recession, you know, I, I think we'll see mm -hmm. and the real liquidity issues. I mean, what the hell happens, as I said, if um, General Electric goes into the junk bond market? What happens to HYG and, and um, JNK, those ETFs? They're going to become completely illiquid. <laughs> and they will trade at 20% so. discounts to the underlying. Mm -hmm. JNK is one of my favorite shorts. I mean, it's interesting that we literally just came off nine consecutive quarters of U.S. growth accelerating, the first tick down in U.S. growth slowing, and the junk bond market shut down. Yeah. It tells you something, right? My Lord. I mean, it tells you something to do with liquidity, and particularly liquidity in, in the credit market is maybe the epicenter of what's coming. Yeah. So back to the CYA nature of fund managers and just trying to keep their job these days. Um, you've, you've been in, in quotes uh, recently about Taco Bell managers versus hedge fund managers. Can, the oversupply of hedge funds, the oversupply of money managers, yeah. what do you think about that? So I've written a lot about this and I think the industry is in decline and it's in structural decline. Hedge fund industry or asset management or both? Both. Yep. Reason being is all the money in the entire system, every single penny outside of the sovereign wealth funds is basically the baby boom retirement money levered. That's right. That money's coming out. Everyone forgets that. You know, realistically, if you go and look at Blackstone, big pools of capital, them, what they're managing is baby boomer money mm -hmm. recycled through the financial system, the, you know, the great financialization. Yes, there's some sovereign wealth, there's some corporate money in that, but that's it. So that has to come out. The death of returns has been a real and meaningful thing within the hedge fund industry because A, too much supply, B, in the short term time horizon, machines are better. It's very hard to, to be yep. better, faster, or have more information. So that just knocks people out of the game. Mm -hmm. And it's, everybody is losing capital right now. Yes, the VCs are getting capital still, or have done okay, PE have, but the hedge fund industry and the asset management industry, the hedge fund industry is first, the asset management industry is to come, I think. Mm -hmm. So I'm bearish on both of them. And I've been short frequently on and off BlackRock and um, um, a bunch of the asset management firms. I mean, you could take that all the way down to private equity. If private equity had to mark the market, they'd have outflows too. I mean, the reality is that private equity didn't see anything happen in the fourth quarter. Isn't no, that amazing? Right. You know, all their marks were what they were. But I do think credit that, froze. I do think the VC is probably the thing that survives this yeah. of the ownership that yep. exists nowadays. And so VC has a good place in that. But private equity and stuff like that, no. They're all picking over the carcasses of dead corporations <laughs> right now. Well, isn't that interesting? In our, in our disruptive, I mean, we compete with all baby boom type products. Yes. All the uh, all, all of them old are. wall media is baby all boomer. Of, absolutely. You know? what, what millennial reads the Wall Street Journal? What, what Gen X, poor Gen X person reads the Wall Street Journal? I mean, you have, and, and maybe that's why, uh, eventually I was going to get to this, but uh, maybe that's why you and I are generally and purposefully ignored by old wall media. I mean, I take it as a compliment. I don't know how you feel about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, they're so busy doing their own thing, creating this universe of people, who, of gray-haired people talking to gray-haired people, of 
and, and cheerleading stock markets <laughs> that they don't actually care about people. And that's, you know, why you and I hit it off is we actually care about people's savings, right? This is not a game, it is actually people's life savings. And I, you know, why I did that whole piece about um, Baby Boomer retirement and we'll probably make a full documentary for Netflix on it, it's because I really care because people are being so badly advised right now. Why people are so overweight equities at 65 years old is a crime because Let's say I'm right and they go into recession, they will lose 50% of their savings because that's what happens. Stock market falls 50%. But once you've retired, you can't buy the dip. Mm -hmm. That's it. Game over. 50%. You're out. So all your life savings can all go in a six-month period. That, but that is what is going on right now. So that's why I care about it and that's what old media doesn't care about. It just is not seeing things through the eye of, that we have a fiduciary responsibility and a moral obligation to care about people's mm -hmm. money. Now, part of this, I mean, uh, and this is more a question about how you're thinking about your company and, and the educational component that you just mentioned, like putting a documentary on Netflix, and I think you did one with PBS. Or, That's right. Um, like, how much interest do you, and you have a, a very high level of interest in anything you produce, but I mean, on the educational side, how, how hard are you pushing in terms of getting people to be aware? We're trying. Um, the problem is, is we're still a growing company, so we've got so many things we want to achieve, and education is one of them, so we're just producing a, um, a series now called Real Vision University, which is to give people some more basic tools. So we're trying to fill in all the gaps, but the best way to educate people is not to do what people do now, which is dryly educate them. It's to engage them with storytelling yep. and get them to understand by that, by that os osmosis of understanding, okay, oh, this is how it works. You know, somebody will have heard the story of me talking about the guy buying Euro dollar futures, and they'll go, oh, okay, I understand now. It's through stories, really, that we can educate people. Yeah. So we use storytelling a lot within Real Vision to A, make it more engaging, but also to be able to get across more complicated things. Mm -hmm. I mean, topics can be trivialized in a good conversation. Yeah. And, and video is certainly a good way to do that. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, let's see, uh, what else do we have here? Um, why do you think people ignore the fact that there is a business cycle or that markets care about the cycle at all? <laughs> <laughs> you had to ask. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know why they ignore it. it you know, I spoke at, I think it was Cambridge University, and the, the topic of my speech was why everything they teach you at finance school is shit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you guys are all taught Keynesianism, mantras, blah, blah, blah. I said, right, so every single thing comes out with an equation, which is a linear thing. <laughs> And right, here's this chart. Does this go up and down, or does it go in a straight line? Everyone's always obviously up and down. So, well, it's a cycle. It has to be. So why don't you start thinking of forecasting things in these terms? The real world is not what they're taught at university. So I don't know why. It's, it, it drives me nuts. But the whole world is split between two schools of economics that are theoretical and not applied. Uh, uh, okay, there. The, now you have somebody who said he's worked on Wall Street for 20 years, has an MBA, and he wouldn't wipe his you know what, with the Wall Street Journal. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Um, let's see. I guess another, an, another thing that people are often interested in, you know, with you in particular, yeah. it's like, why don't you go back to doing what you used to do? Hedge fund managers, this so, is what they I'll want give us you the to truth. I mean, I actually opted out of that game back in 2004. A long time ago. I quit yeah. in 2004. Yeah. And I was running yeah, a reasonably big global macro hedge fund, which I'd started for one of the biggest hedge fund firm in Europe, uh, GLG Partners. And the reason being was I could see where the industry was going. Mm -hmm. The industry was going to lower and lower returns based on the pension industry investing in it and wanting to turn a hedge fund into a bond. Mm -hmm. So they wanted lower volatility, which meant lower returns. So lower volatility, lower returns. The more people came in, the lower the returns. But there was plenty of money coming in, yep. so the supply of hedge fund managers went up. So you've got low returns, a lot of hedge fund managers, and then everybody being forced to focus on two-week to one-month returns. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. There is no alpha in that when you've got too many people chasing the same things over a short-term time horizon, which, if it's macro, as you know, there's, there's only a new piece of macroeconomic data once per month. <laughs> if you're lucky and you find a weekly series that you can use, you might get once a week. But really, things don't move that much. So how can you trade global macro on a one-week view? It, it makes no sense. <laughs> I'm like, I'm out. And I thought, you know... With a business cycle view, no less, where you may only get turns one every 18 months to... Yeah, and so my view was, so what do you do, because it was a bubble, 
At that time, there was clearly more hedge fund managers than there were Taco Bell managers in America, <laughs> and everybody was a hedge fund manager. Well, the best thing was to go and use my experience, which was advising many of the world's most famous hedge fund managers for 20 years um, at Goldman and other places, and then running a hedge fund to write about it. Mm -hmm. And so I started GMI, Global Macro Investor, for that, and I still write it 14 years later. Um, for that, I thought the best thing to do in a, in a bubble is sell picks and, picks and shovels, so that's what I did. Do you feel smarter now that you became a writer and, again, storyteller, uh, full-time educator than when you were actually a hedge fund manager? It's a loaded question, by the way. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, it's a weird thing because I, it's a very nice thing. I get paid to think. It's, it's an incredibly flattering thing to do is get paid to think, but it therefore makes you think more and you learn, a, you try and learn a lot more from your mistakes and what you do right, what you do wrong, your processes and all that stuff. Um, and you, you become observant because you have to become more observant because you need to know about a number more things mm -hmm. than if you're just trading a book where you may focus on a few things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you don't get as much time because of the time horizon issues that the industry was going through to really focus on building bigger term macro framework. So I, I asked yes. that question because, I mean, somebody like you, I mean, you've learned so much so fast since you started your company. And it's very, it, it's, 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 Dan Holland says this all the time. I mean, who you are speaks so loud, I don't need to hear you talk. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, and, and that's the point, is that you see a lot of people, they've, their growth has almost been stunted by just this inability to generate returns. It is a stressful job, what wow. you and I used to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I stopped in 07, you stopped in 04. I mean, I read a book every 10 days. I try to find people like you all around the world. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have conversations like this. Learn, you learn fast, and yeah. you learn what you don't know. Yeah. But that's a tough way you know, to, to be stuck. And I wonder if that's part of the problem, too, is that people just haven't had the time. Well, I agree, and you know, I've got friends who are trapped in that world, trapped that they didn't make enough to get out, yeah. and, uh, and trapped because they don't know where else to go. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard. Um, you and I will have friends trapped at investment banks in the same thing. Right? The average you know, managing director salary has halved and halved again since I was working in the industry. Mm -hmm. And so now they're stuck because they've bought big houses and they've done all this stuff and they can't get a job elsewhere because after a while, if you're in your mid-40s or something, it's difficult to find a different job. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, yeah, it's not, it's not nice to see a secular decline of an industry, but the definancialization of the global economy is an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there used to be a great job which was called trading JGBs, but nobody does that anymore, <laughs> right? And that's what happened. The whole JGB market went from being one of the biggest bond markets in the world, which was very active, to crickets. I mean, they, it didn't trade. Me, I mean, I'm talking my own book, obviously, but maybe that's why we're alone. I mean, there aren't many people that are operating in this arena that we're in because they're stuck in the other one that we used to be in. And that's, to me, like I've been, I'm constantly waking up thinking, who's going to come up and create the next because, hedge eye and compete with me. I, I obviously consider that a credible threat, uh, but I don't see a, a competitor for real vision. And, and yeah. I think what you're doing and we're doing is you're operating outside the, you're doing institutional quality, but bringing them to people and smaller institutions that wouldn't ordinarily get it. So you're kind of disrupting how things are supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really, really good newsletter writers who are independent, yep. but they don't have the scale that you've got and they, don't, they still speak to the same hedge fund managers, like I do with Global Macro Investor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I branch out to more family offices and, and other areas, but people are still speaking to the same crowd. But what you did was say, okay, I'm gonna use this and take it to the people. That's what we did with Real Vision. It's like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna let you sit down with Sam Druckenmiller for an hour and a half mm -hmm. um, in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily do. And we take it to them, and that's, that was a whole new experience. And that's, we've Amazing. both done a very similar thing, which was say, it's not all about the elitism of Wall Street. You guys can have this too, and you deserve it, because you need to make the right decisions. Don't trust everybody else to make decisions for you. Mm -hmm. Was that your most viewed uh, all time? Stan Druckenmiller? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Because it, it was extraordinary how much learning was in that thing. Oh, it was amazing. I mean, first of all, he's one of my idols. So. Yeah. Um, but for people, and this gets back to your point, you have doctors, dentists, people that don't do what you and I have done. You and I you know, have a tremendous level of respect for this guy because we actually do and did what he does. 
Other people are fascinated with him too, though. They probably don't have the faintest idea with some of the things that he's talking about, but they'll watch it. Yeah. And they're truly engaged with, with that kind of content. Because you know, you know when somebody's worth listening to. You can just tell there's a presence about people. Yes. And Stan Druckenmiller has that presence. Where Amazing. you hear him speaking, you're like, okay, this guy is the real deal. And for, the, for people who don't know, he has the best track record almost in the history of the industry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a 35% compounded return for, what, you know, he's not had a down year in, I don't know how many, he's had a, not a down year in 35 years. Mm-hmm. He'd probably call it down here now, like a, his handicap going up or something like that. I mean, at the end of the day, his PA is bigger than more, his personal account is bigger than more people's hedge funds. Um, yeah. But it is what it is. I mean, he was one of the first people to combine top-down macro with bottom-up stock picking. Yeah. And that's, to me, I mean, that's what we do. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's the glory days of macro. That's what I grew up with. I grew up with Stan Druckenmiller, um, Lewis Bacon, Julian Robertson, George Soros, mm-hmm. you know, and there was a guy in London called Nick Roditi, um, who's part of Soros. I mean, these were the legends, and you know, yeah. there's, there's less and less of those around as well, just because the industry doesn't allow those kind of returns because they won't allow that kind of volatility. Yeah, they won't. They won't allow you to whip around your net exposure. No. I mean, uh, maybe the last question on this: in terms of the younger generation, we get a lot. Of, or a lot of your viewers, I'm sure, are certainly are millennials yep. and, uh, and or Gen X. And they see this, what we're talking about here at the end of this conversation, uh, as a tremendous opportunity. If this is where you can get paid more than anywhere on the world being Wall Street, and there's that many people that can be that wrong for that long, then I have a tremendous opportunity to come in as a, as a, as a capitalist and create my own name for myself, my own firm. Have you come across any millennial that just has sparked your interest in, and you just, Say, wow, I can't believe how good this guy is or gal is. I met two recently. One, the New York Times wrote an entire article about, they came to write a story about Real Vision. They wanted to tell it from the story of one of our customers. And we've got 76% millennial and Gen Xs. Is really? Our audience. Is it's that what you have? It's ridiculous. Wow. And they're, they're also fabulously wealthy. 40% earn over 200 grand a year, 40% earn over half a million dollars, um, have half a million dollars in their savings accounts, 88% have a bachelor's degree. It's an incredible group of people. So we got this, we met at a conference, one guy, and he's like, I just want to tell you how much you changed my life. A guy called Kieran O'Day. Oh, right, it was featured in the New York Times article. That's right, and Kieran was a gamer. (laughs) And he taught himself to game by watching videos of other gamers. And there's the whole ecosystem of this thing. And then at one point he thought, I've got vitamin D, I'm sitting inside, I'm not meeting anybody, I'm not doing anything, I need to change my life. His grandfather was one of the founders of Renaissance Capital. In the early days, he was a you know, data scientist guy, mathematician. And he thought, I want to go and do something in, in finance, but I need to teach myself and I don't know anything, but I think that's what I can do. So he, he thought, well, gaming, finance, it's all kind of screens, it's the focus of the attention, it's the pattern recognition, all that stuff. So he went and searched for videos, financial videos, and found Real Vision. He watched <laughs> every single video. Uh, he was what, 21 years old, 22 years old, and now he's launched his own hedge fund. That's awesome. And he was up. Last time when they wrote the New York Times article, it was up like 30% Yeah. last well, year. Well, when people hear these returns, and, and um, I'm not going to rant too much about this, you have a huge advantage if you're not operating within the parameters of, again, having no volatility or no net exposure to the market. Yeah. That means you're not going to generate a big return in the market. No. As long as you understand some elements of risk management and leverage and yeah. those things, you need, you need the basic tools not to blow up. Mm-hmm. But yes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with a bit of volatility. Everyone said volatility is a dirty word now. Volatility is good yeah. as long as you can skew the volatility over time to the upside. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole game and not, and not blow up on the, you know, not blow up in the bad <laughs> down volatility events. Yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's keep trying to do that together because <laughs> what I'm learning, and I think you've learned this too, is if, if you help people not lose a bunch of money when everybody else is losing a lot of money, that's really where we start to build, you know, that whole learning curve yeah. and, and, and our, and our audience and power users is really, to me, I, I see it as a revolution of people that think of money, uh, the way that somebody trying to preserve their net wealth. Yeah. If you try and think, stop trying to cam- um, compound positive returns. We all want to do that, but try to compound less losses and over time you will do better. Just because, you know, Wall Street doesn't do that. Wall Street thinks it's fine to have a 50% drawdown because the market's down 50%. <laughs> That's just stupid. Now, that, that wouldn't work. Uh, John McCullough, my, my father, who's still kicking, uh, the 38 years, retired firefighter, he would not accept 
I don't think he would accept maybe five percent drawdown in, in in net wealth. Like that wouldn't fly. No. So maybe it's in the DNA, you yeah. know, all the way back. <laughs> Good. But thanks for teaching people that. That's a, that's an invaluable lesson, and thanks for building Real Vision. Everybody loves it. Thank you so much, and it's great to be here as well. Yeah. Thanks for making it. Cheers. Cheers. He's Rob Paul. I'm Keith McCullough. That was a real conversation. We'll see you.